I think this breaks the record for the shortest notice ever. <laughs> now, Derek, with the technology we have now, the exhortation that I did over the offering, uh, we could insert that. Yeah. Now you're listening by. If you're listening to this by the internet or tape. I did an exhortation during the offering portion of today's service. And all those people that heard that are still in the room. So uh, those exhortations are not normally on the teaching portion. So rather than them having to listen to that again, we're going to insert that now. <laughs> and then I'll pick up at the end of it. Insert. Thank you, Lord. We sure do need you. We need you, Lord. If we have you, everything else will come under subjection to your name. All we really need is you, Lord. But we sure do need you. Father, we pray that you have your way here today. Father, let everything that's said and everything that's done be pleasing in your sight. And Father, we also pray that nothing be left undone, that it's in your mind to accomplish today. Father, we pray no person leaves this building exactly the same way they came. When we leave, Lord, let us be more your servants than when we arrived. Change us, Lord. We thank you for these things in the name of Jesus. Everybody says, Amen. Open up to Luke 5. For years I, ref I sort of refused to teach out of this passage because of there was so much of a abuse done to it in the 80s and 90s. Uh, by what I call it now the prosperity preachers. You know, God does believe in prosperity. He chooses to live in prosperity himself. If he liked poverty so much, wouldn't he live in it? But there's a big thing, big difference between being a prosperous person and a greedy person. It's a big difference between controlling money and money controlling you. So this passage we're about to look at is in the early days when Sue and I were, we, we, really the Holy Ghost in those days was not our teacher. Our teachers were the television ministries and, the, you know, and the big ones. And we just like little, you know, that's, that's a good thing, you know, just, just swallow the hay and spit out the sticks. Trouble is, when you're new, you don't know what the sticks are. So you just swallow it all, you know. Well, this passage, you know, the one I'm about to, to read here is where Peter loaned Jesus his boat. And I can still, I can hear it. I can hear it in my mind from those days on television, you know. And they do it at offering time. You know, you need to do the same thing so you can get a net breaking, boat sinking, harvest. Anyone ever heard a message like that? In fact, one of those, and I don't ask me who it is, I'm not going to tell you. One of those same ones, I can just hear his voice as plain as anything. Same one I sent the money to for the plastic wallet. <laughs> Never occurred to me, like Dave says, well, if he's got one of those, why don't he just use it himself? <laughs> anyway. Sheep are dumb, you know. <laughs> Thank God the Holy Ghost makes you not quite so dumb. Well, I guess I better read it. We could do a week-long seminar and not exhaust everything in this passage we're about to look at, but we're just going to hit some high points. See, it's a, it is a good question, though, the one we're about to look at. Will Jesus get involved with your business? And if he does, how does he do it? And it does, it doesn't, we're not just talking just to people that own their own business. Will he get involved with your job where you work? Will he make a difference in your finances? Will he not make a difference? Well, let's look here and see. Luke 5, 
verse 1, and it came, I'm just going to read the whole thing first. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draught, or a catch. Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, that's their business partners, which were in the other ship, and they that they should come and help them. And they came and they filled both the ships so that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him, at the catch, the drought of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Now let's just back up a minute and look at this. I'm just going to hit some high points here. Usually this passage was read at offering time like we're doing here right now. And about the only thing that I got out of it was, look, in the same way that Jesus needed Peter's boat, just to, in order to preach the Word of God to the people. He uses these finances to teach the Word of God to the people. And that is true, is it not? I've told you before, I, I want to find the guy who put the gasoline, that tank of gasoline in Michael Muccio's car, the one that brought that little ugly opal to the place of business where Sue and I was so that we could receive the gospel and be saved. There's been a lot of fruit from that tank of gasoline. A lot of fruit around the world from that tank of gasoline. So there is something to be said for that, see. But my my idea when I left, I mean, you know, the only thing that they got across to me is you need to give big and then somehow just expect this prosperity to come. Well, after years of meditating, assimilating, and praying in the Holy Ghost, let's just hit a few high points here. It'll take about two or three minutes, okay? All right? First off, Jesus might need something you have. And it might be more than just this offering. He came to Sue and I said, could I, could I, in the same way that he, he says, Peter, can I borrow your boat to preach the word? Years ago, he came to Sue and I and says, can I, I need your living room on Thursday nights to preach the word. You know, Peter could have said, Lord, sure, you can use it. Let me schedule you a time. A week from Tuesday, would that be good for you? If you're making notes or you get this later, make some notes. He's Lord and you're not. He needs it when he needs it. He needs it when he asks you. Sue and I could have said, Lord, we don't have enough money to do this, which we didn't. We, we would, uh, you know, take, if, even if you're just going to serve tea and, and uh, you can make a lot of tea for a little bit of money, especially if you water it down. I mean, we, we would host 50 people on five bucks many times. You know, you go to go to one of those dollar type stores, you know, and get the big bag of ginger snaps for a dollar. Ginger snaps are not my favorite cookie. I mean, they're okay, but but you do what you can. We could have said, Lord, we can't afford it, or Thursday nights isn't good for us. Can we schedule some other time? Whatever he says to you, do it. In other words, what I'm trying to get across to you here, he, he his prosperity may inconvenience you. It may require some changes. In fact, I can just pretty sure tell you it's going to require some changes. Let's go on. So first off, the timing. You've got to be where he is when he's there. And when he says do it, he doesn't mean next Thursday. Okay? All right, now, when he got through, he says, now I want you to launch out your business. Jesus turned his eyes away from the crowd. And he turned it on Peter's business. That'll be a good day when that happens to you. 
says, all right, I've talked to the crowd, now I want to talk to you about your business. I want you to do it. I want you to cast, I want you to go out now in the daylight and fish. And at the time, everybody did their fishing at night. Let's modernize it. I want you to do your business in a way you've never done it before, in a way that everybody else says is impossible. But I want you to do it the way I tell you. Now, again, Peter could have said, yes, Lord, meet us here tomorrow morning. We're tired. We've been up all night. We're wore out. Meet us here tomorrow morning. You think that would have worked? No. Again, you do it the way he tells you, and you do it when he tells you. You got that? This is what I mean. See, there's a lot more involved that statement that I say all the time, whatever he says to you, do it. There's a lot involved in that sentence. Amen. So we, he could have said that, and uh, but when they went out, he says, never, "He says, verse five." Simon answered, "said Lord, we've toiled all night. The whole reason they were there, washing out their fish nets, they'd already done everything they knew to do, worked hard. They had a job. These are not lazy people. They had done everything they knew to do all night and had caught nothing. So they're just washing out their nets to go home. Here's a note for you." He'll come to you right at the time of your failure. My business is failing. You're in the right spot for a miracle. Might be a good time to hear from the master. <laughs> oh, one more. I'll close for today. Your circumstances don't mean anything to him. He's not moved by your circumstances. Lord, we've been, we've been out here all night, modern day. I'm too old. I, uh, I have health issues. Uh, if it wasn't for my wife, and she's over there saying, if it wasn't for my husband. <laughs> or if, both of them might say, if it wasn't for our kids, we could prosper. And he says, launch out into the deep. Do what I tell you. Is that enough? There's a lot more. To him prospering your business than just plunking the money down in the bucket. Okay, one more. Here's a bonus. Peter didn't refuse to follow the Lord's instructions and go out to his mailbox every day to see if anyone sent him money. In other words, he didn't go and sit in his living room. We gave. It's okay. We can quit our jobs now. We'll just go sit in our living rooms and wait. Our hundred fold's coming. I kind of had that idea. That's kind of the idea that the way it came across, you know. Now, he's going to talk to you about your business, your ministry, whatever it is, whatever it is he has you doing. Will he get involved with your business? Involved is the key word. Yes, he will get involved. That's going to get you involved. Hallelujah. Okay, better stop. Father, <laughs> I've meddled long enough. My Father, but you do have need of resources in the earth, Father. This is one of the ways. We're putting the gasoline in the car now. Lord, this is how we send the gospel. And Father, I know there's people in the sound of my voice that on purpose, they have themselves in training to hear your voice more clearly than they've ever heard it, Lord. To be better stewards for you on the earth. Lord, this is the time. If you have an amount you want them to give, speak now. They'll hear you, and they'll do what you say. The other New Testament way is whatever a man purposes in his own heart. So let him give, not grudgingly, not because you have to. God loves a cheerful giver from the heart. From this offering, people are going to get saved. People are going to get healed. People are going to get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Father, we thank you for the fruit the precious fruit of the earth. In Jesus' name. Coming out of insertion, <laughs> turn to Luke chapter 5. <laughs> Hallelujah. And it's interesting to me how the Holy Spirit really did a review, a wonderful review, I thought, this morning during the 830 service. 
uh, really, that was a lot in one hour. And see, we we're, he's trying to graduate the whole church from formulas to relationship. He really does intend to get involved with your business, to get involved with your prosperity, see. And he does want us to give. He wants us to be a giving people. But the way that it was was presented during the 80s and 90s especially, whether they intended it to come across that way or not, most of us got the idea it's pretty much by formula. If you give, you get. The more you give, the more you receive. Uh, And there was more about the action of the giving than there was about the relationship. Now, this morning's exhortation, when Dave taught the 830 class, was all about what happens when you're praying in the Holy Ghost and how he begins to make intercession for you, and I mean individually you, according to the perfect plan of God. Of course, God has a plan. He has a master plan for the ages, for the whole earth. But in each generation, there is a mind for our gener- for that generation. He had a mind for Solomon's generation. He had a mind for King David's generation. He had a mind for Isaiah's, and he has a, a mind for ours. Now, in particular, he has a mind for your individual part, your role to play in the generation that you live in. Well, what's wonderful about Luke chapter 5 is we get to see, if you'll allow me in the flesh, while Jesus was still operating in his own physical body, a part of how that works. Now, here we literally see Jesus walking up and having this interaction with Peter. And then after Peter does what Jesus asked for, which was loaning the boat. Now notice, and I love this phrase, I'm going to say this one again. The time comes, I mean, at first Jesus was focused on the crowd. And he was focused on the ministry. And focused on delivering the word to the people. But that came to an end. Then he turned around and he focused on Peter's business. You could say you're on Peter's job. And boy, that's a great day when the Lord begins to focus on your business and begins to focus on your job. But I see what we're seeing here is the living manifestation of what happens while you're praying in other tongues now. We're seeing the literal where Jesus can just walk up because he has his own body and he can, he can voice from his mouth to Peter's ear instructions on what to do. And Peter was able to hear him. And notice, it was up to Peter every single time. He could have chosen not to obey. He could have said, well, he could have chosen not to loan the boat. How many of you know there's a lot of fishing boats on that lake? Somebody else could have got that blessing. But he chose to obey. Now, I, I, I don't want to go past here too quickly. Because when you're praying in it... Yes, sir. Go to my son de la Okay, we're in Luke 5. Hold your place there. Go to John somewhere. About 14. Let's see here. It's when Jesus is introducing the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's John 16. And he's talking about the Spirit of Truth that's coming. Notice in John, I still hear the pages turning. Notice in John sixteen thirteen, he says, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come. That's the Holy Ghost, right? He will guide you into all truth. But now notice. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. Now the thing about the Holy Spirit, he's everywhere at once. He is instantly present with each one of us individually. He's also at that same instant present with the Lord in heaven. He is everywhere. He is omnipresent. What Jesus, just so you'll understand this, back up to John 14, 10. You know Jesus said almost that same thing about himself. The Holy Spirit's not going to speak of his own. What he hears, that's what he's going to speak. Now notice, John 14, 10. Believest believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. But But the Father that dwells in me, he doeth the works. 
In other words, Jesus says, I'm telling you what the Father's telling me. Now get this. The Holy Spirit is going to tell you what Jesus is telling him. Who is the head of the church? I mean, the Father during this dispensation has handed over the, this dispensation to the Son. Jesus is the head of the church. And he has, that's why it's him that decides whether you're apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher. No one calls themselves. This goes right along with the 830 message. It's, a, it's his grace. It's his choice what you are. You can't choose yourself to be pastor. You can't choose yourself to be a calling. It's his choice. He is the head of the church. Now, in Luke 5, you see Jesus literally walking up and speaking into Peter's ear. But Jesus was physically on the earth and had his own body. Now, for Jesus to speak to Peter, if he was alive in this dispensation, he speaks it from the right hand of the Father. The Holy Spirit hears that. And when you pray in other tongues, he is communicating those mysteries into your spirit. And you'll receive your instructions and they won't be any less clear than what Peter received. You'll get it in a fashion that you... Can you understand, launch out into the deep? Can you understand the sentence, let down the net? Can you understand how... Hey, that's not rocket science. Raise your hand if you could do those things. Get in the boat. Go out into the water. Put your net over the side. How many could follow that? How, that's clear enough? That's exactly how the Holy Spirit, to that level where you can understand it, that's exactly how He'll bring you the mind of Christ. For whatever it is He's called you to do. And get this. He'll do it on a daily basis. And actually, he'll do it on an hourly basis. We have been given the mind of Christ by the Holy Spirit, who's been sent as the first fruits, as the earnest. Now, we don't have Jesus. I used to think this was a great disadvantage because I said, that's not fair. Peter could literally see you walking up. He could see you, Jesus, walk up. He knows it's you. And he could literally hear your instructions. And I used to think that was a great disadvantage. Because, have you noticed? The trumpet blast doesn't come. do 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 Incoming message from Jesus by the Holy Ghost. This time it's really God and not just you. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And because it's like that, we tend to doubt. And there is, there is a time of learning. You know, there is your ideas, your thoughts. i got news for you. There's the devil's thoughts. Then there's the thoughts from Jesus Christ. And there is a... I have had my trips to the barber shop at 2 in the afternoon because Jesus sent me there. I mean, I, you know. And I got there and the barber shop was closed. And why did Jesus send me? Why, Brother Dave, why, Brother Dave, did Jesus send me to the barber shop at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and it was closed? <sighs> Gary, he didn't send you. <laughs> there is a time of sorting those things out. There is, hey, be willing to make a few trips. Be willing to make a few, you know, it's okay. It's okay. Don't quit. Don't quit. You'll tap into the vein. You'll get to where you... You get to where you can discern those things. But can you see that how the Lord's tying these two messages together? He intends for us to receive instruction just like what you're seeing in Luke chapter 5. Now, this is going to blow, I'm going to blow some of your hat in the creek here now. Now, you do know that at the end of John, you do know that at the end of the Gospel of John, John says, what's written here has been enough for you to believe. But he says, if all the things that Jesus did, I mean, he's like, we haven't hardly touched the surface. If we were to try and write down all the things that Jesus did, all the books in the world couldn't contain it. 
So we're seeing a tip of the iceberg of all the things that Jesus did. And, and the reason I say that is Jesus always has a reason for everything he does. He always has a reason. Now here's where I'm going to blow your hat in the creek. Notice it. Let's look at the end of this, how this finishes up. Let's look when the, you know, we've already talked about receiving the instructions and doing it the way that Jesus said. And even though nobody else does it that way, never mind that we're tired. He comes right at the, at, at the point of your failure very often. He gives you an idea. So we've already talked about all that. So let's look at the end of it. So when the, when the blessing started coming, verse 6, When this they had done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. Now, this is a big catch. This is a big harvest. I can just hear those preachers. I mean, it was a net breaking. Boat sinking. After they toiled all night and caught nothing now. More than they could bring in. And if you'll just send in a hundred dollars, we'll send you this wallet that'll never go empty. Oh. Well, let's, let's, let's depart from that. <laughs> That's 20 some odd years ago. <laughs> but it is a great, but we can't, and for years I almost refused to teach out of this passage because of the abuses like that. That we're done. It took me a long time to glean the truth out of it. See, but it is a big catch. And it, but now notice, there's a reason. Now, when uh, when Simon Peter saw verse eight, how big the catch was, he's looking at this. Hey, hey, the God of the universe, He can impress you with His prosperity. He can impress you to the point you fall down on your knees. Say, God, God, this kind of blessing only God could do this. I'm about ready to be impressed. I think the world's going to be impressed at some of the things they're going to see. Okay? All right? For he was astonished. I mean, astonished. And all that were with him at the, at the catch of the fishes which they'd taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And then, now notice this. Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not. From henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they brought their ships to land, what happened? They forsook all and followed him. I didn't understand that for the longest time. Now here's where we're going to blow your religious hat in the creek. That whole catch was provision and not pound. Jesus didn't ask for an offering out of it. He didn't say like he did to the rich young ruler, go sell all that you have, give to the poor. Jesus knew he was about to call Peter, James, and John full time into the ministry. Peter was a married man, had a family. You think Jesus doesn't care about his family? How about James? I don't know whether James and John were married or not. He's calling them full time in the ministry. You reckon this might tide them over for a little while? Say, well, he never did that again. If all the things that Jesus did were written down, all the books in the world couldn't contain it. He'll take care of your family. If you'll listen to him and do what he tells you. And notice, he provided... We talk about, Sue and I talk about the early, early days when we first started in the prison ministry. It never in those days entered into our mind that somebody might give us money to do that. We, I was in the construction business. We also had a real estate business. Just like this. Whose business was funding Peter's launch? Notice how things are different then. What, what, I hate to say this even. Most of our, quote, missionaries, quote, they're taught to go and get a base first. Get a donor base first. That is one way to do it. I'm not saying the Lord would never say do that. But He sure didn't tell Peter to do that. 
He says, if you'll just listen to me, I can show you how to make enough money in a single day to fund the launch of your ministry. You could serve me full time, boy. And if that's not enough, I know how to catch fish along the way. <laughs> and I don't know how he did it. I don't know how they did it. But in this case, you can tell he used Peter's own business to fund the launch of the ministry. That's what he did with us. We made our own money. Thank you very much. Bought our own gas. Put it in our own van. If the prisoners needed Bibles, we bought them. We didn't come to you for a donation. It didn't even, that kind of thinking didn't even enter our mind. Make your own money. Use for the gospel. But in this particular instance, this is all provision. Now, later on he told Peter, Peter, not only your fish belong to me, but the day is going to come, boy, when you're going to become a martyr for me. But that's not till you're an old man. Do you ever wonder how Peter could sleep in that prison? And they're threatening to take his head off it the next day. You ever wonder how he could sleep? Most people wouldn't be sleeping. They're coming in the morning. This is it. This is my last night. You know why he could sleep? It had only been a little while since Jesus had told him, you're going to be an old man. He says, I don't care what they say. They can't kill me. I'm not old. <laughs> anyway, but I digress. In the early days, again, when the, this passage was taught, it was always connected up mostly with your giving and not so much, in fact, not ever. I mean, I'll just be honest with you. I don't ever remember him talking about spending time praying in tongues in order for you to receive your instructions from the Lord. But that's how the Lord walks up to you now and gives you your instruction. And it may come in a variety of ways. You may hear it. You may have a dream. You may have a vision. And I really wish there was that trumpet blast that always told you when it's, when it's the Holy Ghost. Now, for example, now, for example, in the early, early days, God would, he was, de I cannot say that he wasn't dealing with me about learning to use a computer, but I had been out of school since 19, everyone say, 1969. <sighs> My brain had become like a lead brick, you know. It was difficult. I hadn't learned anything new in so long. And computers just intimidated me, but this idea kept coming that, you know, my, and I wouldn't talk about it, but the idea would come that I ought to learn how to use a computer. I just flat wasn't listening to it. I mean, they intimidated the heck out of me. So the Lord, bless his heart, began dealing with my wife. And I have a really good wife. Sue, stand up. Stand up. Come on, baby. Stand up. Let them see you, baby. I got a good wife. She is a gift from God. And, and I don't know if she, she probably didn't know. Maybe she did know. But the Lord was putting it in her. And she has this way of getting me to do the right thing and make me think it's my idea. She never nags me. She never, ever. But she would just say things like, I mean, she would, I remember those early days, we would sit with our friends and some of them had gone on and learned computers and they're talking about gigabytes and megahertz and, and I'm sitting there like, well, when did they learn Portuguese? I have no idea what they're talking about, you know. And she would see that look on my face and I'd go, my goodness. But she just, had, she'd say things like this, pat me maybe, you know. Honey, you're so smart. I bet if you ever started learning those computers, I bet you'd really be good at that. And I'd sit there and go, I am pretty smart. <laughs> now, keep this all connected. Because I kept rejecting the instruction, because I was praying during those days, and the idea kept coming. You need to learn how to use a computer. I didn't recognize it was Jesus. So he has to, but I kept praying. So he has to go, and she's praying too. So he has, now he's working through my wife, trying to get it across to me, his mind. And gently, every now and then, she'd say, you know, you know, you really are. You're good to learn things. Yes, I really am. <laughs> I bet if you ever just started... You'd, you'd probably really be a whiz. You'd probably be really good at those computers. I probably would be. 
<laughs> now, that, long story short, I finally bought a used computer. It so intimidated me, that one-eyed monster. I hadn't learned anything new in so long. I bought all those computers for dummies books, Windows for dummies, Word for dummies. And I would I'd carefully, I'd read the instructions. I'd do whatever it said. And with fear and trembling, I'd press enter. And the thing would crash. And I'd go, you, get, get, get. And I'd walk in, so you'd walk, see me walking in the living room, praying in tongues. It's better than what, what else I could be doing. Love you, Jesus. But he'd build me up, and I'd walk back in there, wouldn't I, baby? I'd walk, I'd stand, and I'd talk to this inanimate object, like Jesus talked to the tree. And I'd say, you're a machine, and you will obey me. I'm going to learn how to use you. You're going to be my slave. I did, I did, I not. <laughs> I'd, say, oh, I'd say, bow the knee. <laughs> I'd get so frustrated, I can't tell you the number of times I wanted to make that thing into a nice boat anchor. You know? But I kept going back to it. And it wasn't easy, really. My brain, I hadn't really tried to learn anything new. Now, fast forward a few years, quite a few years now. You all, most of all, most of y'all know about our ministry. The number one way that he's using it right now is on the internet. While I'm talking to you, my voice is being heard in I don't know how many countries right now, all over the world. Not only that, there's prayer requests. We have written lessons that can be downloaded and printing. Just, was it important? Was it important that I learn how to use a, a computer? Absolutely it was, see. But now, it took him a long time to get that across to me. And But if you'll keep praying, he'll go through your wife. <laughs> he'll come through your friend. Listen, I, this is one of my favorite sayings, and it, I've been at it a long time. Trust me, this will hold up. He is smarter than you are dumb. That's what I say about me all the time. Lord, you're smarter than I am dumb. I know if I keep praying, even if you have to go to plan Z, <laughs> all the way from A to Z, you will get it across to me if I don't quit. I was talking with Jerry one day, a few years ago, we was talking about this, because it, it looked like the enemy through circumstances had painted Jerry into a box, you know, and we was talking about this, and he'd had an accident and, and was having some uh, some problems, you know, and... Uh, it looked like every avenue. If I, well, if I try and do this, I, I have this physical problem. If I try and go this way, I've got another problem. And it just looked like the enemy just had him, you know, in a box. And we got to talking. And I said, Jerry, you can't live there anymore. He's got you in a room where there's no answers. The devil has. He's painted you into a corner. You have got to step out of the box, man. You don't live there anymore. You've got to get the word of God in your mouth and pray in the Holy Ghost. Boy, now, most, I've told that to a lot of people over the years, and most of them, it just, that doesn't change them. Jerry began praying. He began confessing. Every time I'd see him, he'd say, Gary, I don't live there anymore. I don't live there anymore. And sure enough, all kinds of things began happening. He wound up getting a job that he thought he couldn't get. Uh, wound up working in a ministry he didn't think he could work in. On and on and on. There is no such thing as no answer when you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, where we tend to get in trouble is when we listen for formulas. <laughs> I'm trying to be nice. One of the first ways that the Holy Ghost brought me out of the, the formula mindset. Let's look at Luke 5 again. We've got time for this. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. He entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now, let's just stop. There was a real need. Great crowds had begun following the Lord Jesus. He'd come to this... Uh, particular group and the crowd was so big he's teaching by the lake 
to the point they're thronging upon him, about, about to push him into the water. He needs something. So he really, really, in, even in the natural, he needs a boat. All right? Now, again, there's a lot of people, a lot of fishermen, make their living fishing on that lake. You think the, you think the word did not get around about that net breaking, boat sinking, load of fish? You think the other fishermen didn't hear about that? And they said, Peter? You mean Peter? We know that guy. Lord, we've been out here fishing with him for years. You mean what? All he did, he let, the, he let Jesus of Nazareth use his boat. And as a result, he got a net breaking boat sinking load of fish. Not just one boat full, but two boats full. I know what I'm going to do. Then I had this little vision. Now the next day, let's just to say for, this is the way the vision was. Jesus wasn't teaching by the lake. He was out in the wilderness on a mountainside. And he's teaching the people again. And great throngs are there listening to him. Maybe it was the Sermon on the Mount. I don't know. But one of those times when he's teaching out in the desert. Great throngs are there. Jesus is up on the hillside teaching the people. And he looks off in the distance. And he sees something. What is that? And it's one of those other fishermen that heard the story about Peter loaning Jesus his boat. So he's formula-minded. He says, well, now, if, Je- if, if Peter loaned Jesus his boat and got a big blessing, I'm going to loan Jesus my boat and get a big blessing. Trouble is, Jesus is preaching in the desert that day. So he hired about 30 longshoremen, 30 big burly guys, and they've got ropes on the front of that fishing boat. They're dragging it through the desert sand, trying to get it to Jesus. Jesus is looking on the mountain. Oy vey. <laughs> Surely it can't be. Nobody, nobody could be that formula minded. Nobody could think that I need a boat here in the wilderness. Surely they're not thinking that. One time... Yanji Cho told us, most of you know who Paul Yanji Cho is, who built the largest church. At one time, it, it was the largest church on earth. It may still be. It's in Korea. And you can read his books, you know, about how he did it and how the Lord had him build that. And, and uh, gosh, it was a, it's huge. I, I, for, the Lord has blessed me. I've actually been able to attend a service in that church on Yoweda Island in Korea. But in one of his books, Yanji tells this story. He says a group of young men who were impressed by reading the books of Yanji Cho, how he built his church. They got together and they decided they were going to go into the next province and they were going to duplicate the same thing. So they were very careful. They studied their notes and everything that he did. They did exactly what he did. And after a couple of years, the thing was a total failure. So they came back and arranged to get a meeting with Pastor Cho, told him what, he had, what they had done. And, and they said, we don't understand this. We did exactly what you did. I mean, we're good students. We studied everything that you did. You, you did cell groups. We did cell groups. You did this. We did, th- we did exactly everything. And it was a total failure. And yours is, <laughs> look how the Lord has blessed what you've done. So Yanji Cho, he says, this is in his book. He says, ah, oh, I see you have become the disciples of Cho. But you have not yet become the disciples of Jesus. I did what Jesus told me to do to build this church. And you need to do what Jesus tells you to do for your ministry. There it is. Now the thing that amazed me and scared me and blessed me and frightened me and excited me, and humbled me, was when the Holy Spirit got it across to me one day. I have the same access to the instructions from the mind of Jesus that Peter had. The Holy Spirit said, I will not fail to precisely communicate to your mind 
what I hear from his mind. Pastor Dave.